So I'm I'm excited. You got the Triphasic Two book coming out. So speak to us on what we have to look forward to, different methods involved, key principles, and then we're going to talk about how we can apply some of those principles in a high school weight room without all the the perfect, beautiful mind and the spotters. <laughs> Yeah, so the Triphasic 2 book will hopefully be out very soon. Uh, obviously doing that with, with Coach Cal Dietz. And the premise is it's all new material. So it's based on the same theory of the Triphasic 1 book, uh, which has been out it's almost 11 years since then. So it's all new methods using that same uh, principle and idea. And how we decided to break it down is taking people through like a warm-up all the way through the different phases of training and then putting the methods with within that. So for example, like the warm up, we'll talk about RPR, reflexive performance reset. You have something he calls the the goat drill, which is this crazy drill of like running between hula hoops and looking at one thing and passing the ball around and um, all the way through some of the different methods, you know, one of them being like the super max method, which is a more advanced method. Uh, where you may use 110, 120% of your one rep max, but you're controlling it for uh, specific eccentrics. Um, two other things that are a little bit more, I would say simple, but not really done. So for example, if you are training more and your goal is just a strength phase, right? So you basically have three phases, strength, speed, and power, if you're to make it pretty, pretty simple. Um, if you're more in a strength phase, if you watch people during the acceleration phase of running, they're going to be a little bit wider stance and they're going to be a little bit more externally rotated. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're doing RDLs with a little wider stance, a little more external rotation. If, however, you're trying to improve just all out top end speed, if you're watching someone when they're sprinting, you'll see their feet are more straight ahead and their, their width becomes much more narrow. So if your goal was to increase all out speed, Let's take the RDL as the same example again. Then you may have them come in a little bit closer on their stance and you may have their feet a little bit more straight ahead. Again, there's all these different methods because what you want is the transfer to the actual field. Like you can build some freaks in the weight room, which is great, but if they can't transfer those skill sets onto the field, it's not really helping you. Other than it makes you look like cool, you got good numbers and stuff, um, but you actually want all these concepts to transfer to the field. So the book is designed to give you new training methods, but the ultimate goal is to have all these methods transfer from the weight room to the field for performance. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And and that's that's the goal of training, right? We don't want to make the strongest guys on the bench. We want to have them perform and execute and move some people around and just be awesome on the field. So now it, with all this understanding, imagine now the weight room where 120%, where we got 50 high schoolers in there, that may not be optimal. So what are some yeah. tools, <laughs> uh, methods, approaches for eccentrics that we could apply? We can go in order here and start with eccentrics to apply. And then I'll, I'll share some things that I've I've successfully done safely uh, for for a high school. How would you approach the overload with eccentrics at that high school level? I mean, obviously you want to grade it to wherever they're at. Um, you're going to be limited probably by equipment. You may not even have racks for everybody. So I usually, from an engineering standpoint, look at, okay, what are my constraints of the system? Like how strong are they? Are? What do I have got for dumbbells? What do I got for equipment? What do I have for space? How many stations am I going to run at a time? Like what are what are kind of the, the limits? Because you have to operate and find a solution within those limits. So let's say you're you're pretty basic. Like you don't have a lot of you know safety racks that people could be in. You've got limited equipment. Um, a simple one you can do is uh, like for like a hex bar deadlift or trap bar deadlift, you could do a two up, one down. And this would not even need any other uh, spotters or any help. So let's say you're just doing 225. So you have that on the ground. You would go to the top of the lift, so you would have both feet there. So it would be 225, let's say, for a single for your concentric phase. Mm -hmm. And then eccentric, before you do the eccentric, you would shift into like a kickstand stance or B-stance or split types of stance. And then you would take four, five, six seconds to lower it to the ground. And then you go back to two down, two feet, 
and then switch again. So it's kind of a two feet up, one foot down. And then you're getting a high amount of eccentric overload on the way down on that eccentric. Um, but you don't need any spotters. You don't need any equipment. Obviously, if something goes wrong, you can just let go of the bar. Nothing real bad is going to happen. At the trap bar, it's generally going to be more in line with the athletes. You have a little bit less, you know, low back concerns and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. The yeah, dumbbells are definitely a go to in the past. I've done the the, the staggered sure. dance or the split. And then for the most part at this age group, grip strength is going to be the limiting factor over the legs. So we're st still getting overload. Yep. I know it's not to a T of, of the book prescription, but still they're, they're gaining their body awareness by an eccentric versus just taking the, the weights for a ride. So, uh, I like, I like that two feet up one foot down. I'm definitely gonna, to, to work with that now. Here's a battle I have constantly is with isometric face. If outsider looking in, they see these kids not moving. It means they're not working hard. So the yep. same conversation is had with rest and during speed and sprints, but then even isometrics for the, the uninitiated, uh, not a good thing. So sticking with application within isometrics. Now, again, uh, what, we can still use the barbell. We got the trap bar. We got dumbbells. What are a way that I can across the board allow isometrics to be applied to a big group uh, in a group setting for training? I mean, depending on the level of the athlete, I'm a huge fan of like a Bulgarian split squat going all the way down to the bottom where maybe your knee is just barely off the ground. And just holding that position for, you know, 5, 10, 15 seconds, it's a lot harder than people think. <laughs> um, and you can play with that if you have to sell it as more athletic. You can be like, okay, so even just body weight, um, get down to the bottom, hold that for six seconds. And now I want you to accelerate out of it. Like I want you to do actually get off of the ground from that position. Right. So what are you doing? You're taking all that stretch shortening cycling out of it. There's an old Australian research, I think, that said it took five or six seconds, I think, to get rid of the stretch shortening cycling on bench press. And we don't know if that applies to, you know, other lifts or not. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but even just holding that for six seconds and then having them come out of it explosively. So even if someone's watching that, you could be like, hey, you know, would you agree athletics is getting into a position and then being able to get out of that position as fast as possible? Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's exactly what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Right. So you add that kind of explosive component to it. I'd say that's more or less to kind of to, to sell it, but it is a real thing that, that you're training. And if you want more emphasis on the musculature, that'll be a way to shift that emphasis more to the musculature than the, the soft tissue elasticity portion. Yeah. I, I like that too. Just wrote down some fast notes that, that came to me that I can apply. I like the, even the one feet now in that ISO to two feet. So it's almost like a reverse. Yep. So now I'm catching in a uh, speed stance, if you will. Um, I like yeah. that. And you can have them use light dumbbells, right? So do the eccentric, get into there, hold the dumbbells, do the isometric. Okay. Now let the dumbbells go at the bottom and then go into an explosive phase. Right, if you really want to start overloading it, I like it. And then last is is with the concentric. So the, this this does take coaching. If I'm introducing this uh, to kids for the first time, in this this uh, the cyclical connected reps for concentric versus the one and two and three. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking one one one. So now speak to us about the 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 reasoning and the purposing there for consecutive concentric versus just the, the, the single reps with a pause relaxed at the top. Yeah. I mean, if you look again at athletics, you want the ability to repeat high outputs as fast as possible. And that gets into, you know, what is your rate limiter? Is it strength? Is it your aerobic system? Is it, you know, whatever. Um, but all things being equal, if you have a higher level athlete, would be someone who can repeat those high velocity, high output movements with less rest, right? So you think of American football, right? You think of the players who are better conditioned, who are more advanced, you know, their play of quarter one versus the last play of quarter four, 
probably doesn't look that different, right? Compared to someone who is more inexperienced, more deconditioned, you know, not more, not nearly as developed. Yeah, quarter one and quarter four look pretty different. Like, oh God, is that the same person? I'm I'm not really sure, right? So you'd want it to be ideally the the same as much as possible. And even within that, there's a system that Cal uses where you have you change directions as fast as possible also. So again, there's some older Russian research that shows that their elite level athletes at some point were not necessarily stronger, but they had the ability to relax much faster. So again, you think about high level athletics, you think about change of direction, ability to repeat things. So he'll do a fair amount of work with bands, like even on the hamstring one where you've got bands going across and you're kind of kicking down against the bands back and forth. And it it looks kind of easy if you see as high level athletes do it till you actually try it yourself and you're like, it is horribly hard. Well, at least for me, I'm not very athletic. It is ridiculously hard. But what you're doing is you're getting that hamstring to go on, off, on, off, on, off, like back and forth, back and forth really, really fast. Um, and again, it's a higher velocity movement, generally unloaded. So it's a little bit um, safer. Um, but even just some easy stuff like that, I think it's not easy, but it's you don't need a lot of setup for it. It doesn't take as much time. And it's something that athletes, when they get better at it, they're like, oh, yeah, I get it. I I I see how this is going to make me a better athlete. They kind of, it's easy for them to understand also. Yeah. Yeah. I love those. And it, it's easy to set up in a rack. Most, most facilities, most gyms have those bands across and then yep. it, a, an alternative is, is they, um, I'm trying to remember the, the name, what you call it, you know, this sit up ball, it's inflatable ball. what, it's oh, like a like a Swiss ball. Swiss ball, yeah. So simple there. You just got to find a way to to lock it in place and yep. uh, kick it there. How I've done this in the past, some success is my partner is is across from me, and he's a, he's holding a pillar or a push up position, and then squeezing that ball with the groin. So we're getting some isometric, and then his partner's going fast feet, you know, hips up off the ground. So that that turns it into a little fun. It's not the the optimal experience, but again, we're dosing, we're exposing them, and again, we're we're taking this and applying it across 50, 50 guys. So it's fun. Um, yeah, cool. and those things you find you know transfer to the field, right? Because my biggest pet peeve at the high school setting is just there isn't a lot of thought in terms of the quality of what transfers, right? And unfortunately, you see this. When they start running, you know, different agility drills or whatever, it just turns into a bunch of people running horrible. It sounds like a herd of elephants, like hitting each other. It's just, oh, yeah. It's like, oh, let's just do speed ladders again. I'm like, oh, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of pussyfooting. And then on speed days, basically hitting your sprints however long and then hustling back to the start of the line. And yep. Yeah. Again, not not your intent is there your effort is there but we're not we're yes. missing the adaptation so that's there's a lot there's a lot of education to be done that's why we're here though yeah yeah i remember early on like cal was trying to explain this concept to me he had this huge whiteboard i'm the only one sitting in the meeting and <laughs> thinking okay i gotta put this in the book somehow and he's drawing stuff up he fills this whole whiteboard up for like 43 minutes and i'm just sitting there going how the F am I ever going to explain this to anyone who's not sitting here? And I took a little bit and I went, okay, so you're telling me the goal is to do the highest quality work first and then do more volume. And he kind of looks at me and he goes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> 45 minutes in one line. Yep. <laughs>